This is Valley News Live at 5. Governor Doug Burgum announcing he's lowering North Dakota's statewide risk level for COVID-19 from high risk to moderate risk. The governor is also increasing capacity limits for restaurants, bars, and gatherings as active cases and hospitalizations due to COVID-19 have decreased in North Dakota. Bars and restaurants have been operating at up to 50% capacity with no more than 150 people. Starting this Friday, January 8th, they can operate at 65% capacity with no more than 200 people. To read the governor's full order, you can head to our website, valleynewslive.com, and click on this story. New at 5, an investigation conducted by the Bureau of Criminal Investigations into the North Dakota Catholic Diocese found that two clergy members accused of child sex abuse cannot be charged because the statute of limitations has run out. According to Attorney General Wayne Stengem, an 18-month investigation looked into 53 people within the North Dakota Catholic Diocese accused of child sex abuse. Of the 53 names, only two were alive at the time the investigation began. Norman Dukert of Dickinson and another clergy member who moved to Minnesota. BCI agents say during the course of the investigation, another clergy member, Odo Moogley, of the Assumption Abbey in Richardson was identified as another suspect. The Attorney General's office determined there was probable cause to charge both of them. However, because the abuse happened so long ago, the statute of limitations has run out and neither can be charged. Hard to believe we're seeing this kind of weather in January. Let's find out if our Monday evening will be just as nice. Hutch? Beautiful conditions to start out the first uh, work week of the new year with temperatures way above average. We just slipped out of the 40s in the James River Valley, Andrea, at 30 degrees in Devils Lake, 31 in the Thief River area, and 32 for Bemidji. In Fargo, crystal clear skies. Temperatures will slip into the 20s here as we go through most of our evening, but the wind remains light and for now the skies remain clear in Fargo with the sun that is set just a few moments ago, about seven minutes ago. Grand Forks likewise, although late night teens are on the way for many of us and some fog is going to be in the forecast. Andrea, your Tuesday will bring a chance for some snow showers that could accumulate for some of us. I'll have details on when it will impact your day and exactly where we're expecting those flakes here in just a couple of minutes. All right, thanks Hutch. Fire officials now know where the fire started at a building in North Fargo. It happened last month at 1418 First Avenue North and started in a room near the center of the building. The place was equipped with a sprinkler system, but it wasn't properly maintained and it was shut off for some time. Damage is estimated to be more than $200,000. The balance of power in the U.S. Senate could shift following tomorrow's runoff elections in Georgia. As our Washington, D.C. Bureau correspondent Kristen Casper reports, there's a chance there could be a 50-50 tie. And if that happens, who would be in charge? We'll head to Washington to find out. Two Senate races, one state, high stakes. As control of the U.S. Senate hangs in the balance, Michael Thorning with the Bipartisan Policy Center guides us through some of the post-election scenarios. The outcomes are extremely important for the country. If either Republican Senators David Perdue or Kelly Loeffler prevail following Tuesday's runoff, Republicans will have the majority and keep control of the chamber. But if both seats flip... Democrats would have the upper hand after Vice President-elect Kamala Harris takes her oath. That much is laid out in the Constitution. The Vice President breaks any tie votes that should come up, uh, but the implications are actually much bigger than that. In the past, the way the Senate has worked is that the party um, of the Vice President gets to be the majority party. And the majority party gets to determine the agenda, what bills are voted on, shaping the floor debate, and so on. Thorning says we've actually seen a tied Senate before, back in 2001. Vice President Cheney uh, essentially, uh, you know, tipped the scales, if you will, for Republicans. Uh, and so they came up with a, a formal agreement. Uh, it was passed by the Senate um, by a resolution of how they would share power in this time. If a similar split happens again, Thorning says another agreement would likely be reached and the Senate reins could be handed back to Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. If Republicans end up maintaining power in the U.S. Senate, it will preserve checks and balances as Democrats will be in control of the White House and the U.S. House of Representatives. Reporting in Washington, I'm Kristen Casper.
And all eyes are on those critical Senate runoffs in Georgia. Vice President Mike Pence making a visit on election eve to campaign for GOP Senate incumbents Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. Recent polls show the races are virtually tied down the stretch between all the candidates. More than three million people have already cast their ballots, a record early turnout for a runoff election. With the fate of the U.S. Senate hanging in the balance, Pence is making a last-minute appeal. We'll hear the objection. It's amazing to think of what we've done. It all begins with our national defense. You know, I'm your... President Trump is also in Georgia this evening for a rally in Dalton. The 117th Congress is now in session. The newly elected lawmakers are starting a new chapter with the most diverse class yet. This morning, the incoming House GOP freshman class posed on the Capitol steps for their first group photo. There are a number of firsts for this Congress, including the first Republican Native American woman, Representative Yvette Harrell of New Mexico, and the youngest member of Congress at only 25 years old, Representative Madison Cawthorn of North Carolina. Members of Congress were sworn in on Sunday, and now they'll get down to business. Despite the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine launching in the UK today, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the country will be announcing even tougher lockdown measures. Johnson visited a London hospital this morning as the first shots were being given and acknowledged that citizens may be frustrated with the tighter restrictions. England has recorded more than 50,000 new virus infections every day for the past six days. The, the crucial thing is to, to recognize that we've got a a new variant that uh, is requiring extra special vigilance. And um, we will do everything we can to, to keep the virus under control. And uh, people should be in no doubt that the government will do uh, everything that is necessary. Johnson is stressing that at this critical moment, it's also vital that people remain disciplined. The founder of WikiLeaks will not be returning to the United States to face charges of espionage. A judge ruled against his extradition, but not based on his legal team's assertion of free speech. CBS's Elizabeth Palmer explains. The verdict came as a surprise and prompted a huge cheer from Assange supporters who are gathered outside the central criminal court here in London, the Old Bailey. The judge has ruled that Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States to stand trial. And she made the decision on mental health grounds. She says that Assange is depressed and that conditions in U.S. jails, which she described as oppressive, would make him a serious suicide risk. If extradited, he would have faced 18 counts, one of computer hacking and 17 espionage charges, all of them relating to classified documents that he published on the WikiLeaks website relating to the Afghan and Iraq wars, along with thousands of confidential diplomatic cables. Although she did block his extradition, the judge rejected Assange's defense that he was protected by freedom of speech. Theoretically, if he was found guilty, he could have faced decades in jail. In spite of this morning's verdict, Julian Assange has not walked out of court a free man. He's been sent back into custody. The U.S. legal team is planning to appeal this decision as soon as sometime this very week. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, London. Today, Mexico's president offered him asylum in his country. The controversy over Prince's estate is heating up again. The IRS now says administrators have undervalued it by 50 percent, or about $80 million. The rock star, who died of a fentanyl overdose in 2016, did not leave a will. The IRS determined that Prince's estate is worth $163 million, overshadowing the $80 million valuation submitted by the estate's administrator. The discrepancy mostly involves Prince's music publishing and recording interests. T-Mobile suffered a security breach last month that may have exposed customers' call records. The company says the information did not include names, physical or email addresses, credit card or social security numbers, passwords or PINs. T-Mobile says it has notified the roughly 200,000 people who may be affected. 
A new residential transfer station is now open at the Fargo landfill. The transfer station allows residents of Fargo to drop off certain items at no charge. That includes up to two appliances per month, cardboard, automotive batteries, metal objects, household garbage, and all-in-one recycling. They ask that you separate the items into the appropriate bins in the building. An attendant will be available to help. Proof of residency is required. Still to come, if you're in search of the perfect job, there's a new tool that might help. And it was a great way to start the work week. Temperatures very warm, well above average in the 30s. But we do have some changes in your forecast. Details right after this.